Okay, so at this time, I would like to welcome our presenter, James Jilka. He is a park ranger with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And today, James is going to present to us the flood of 1955. Thank you, James. Thank you, Allison, uh, and thank you all for attending today. Um, it is uh, not often that I get to get out in front of so many people and kind of spread the good word about what we do. Um, and also be of service to the community. So hopefully this is useful. Um, I have my uh, park ranger cap on. I'm gonna actually take it off if you don't mind. I have a, uh, you can't tell when I wear this, I have a giant head already. Uh, I don't need that to make it any bigger. Um, I'm gonna be going through a PowerPoint presentation today about the flood of 1955, um, sharing some facts and figures uh, from a flood risk management perspective. I'll talk a little bit about what the Army Corps does, and I encourage you all to ask questions as we go in the chat. Um, Allison, I'll be um, putting up my presentation here, so if you want to just stop me at any time, let me know if there are questions, or if you lose me, um, just uh, give me a heads up, all right? And uh, with that, let me go ahead and start sharing my screen. I'll pull up my presentation here. And window, which one, there we go. Okay, uh, Allison, can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Okay, so we're all here to uh, learn a little bit, or for some of you, maybe remember a little bit about the flood of 55. Uh, this is uh, near and dear to me because it's really why we, as the Army Corps of Engineers are here um, in this area. So uh, again, my name is James Jilka. I am a natural resource specialist, aka a park ranger with the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, I am employed by the Army, but I'm actually a civilian. Uh, I've been doing this for about two years now, uh, so I'm relatively new to it, and some of you are probably more of a wealth of information than I am. Uh, so feel free to share your experiences or your knowledge. Uh, we're going to do a Q&A session at the end. Um, so I'll try and keep us on track to make sure that we have time for that. Um, I am located up at Colebrook Dam. If anybody has been there, it's up in Colebrook, Connecticut. And it is upstream on the Farmington. So when you see those flows on the Farmington, uh, we are part of the management of those flows, although uh, the bulk of what comes down the river actually is coming from um, um, Goodwin Dam, which is just below us. It's uh, run by the MDC. All right, so let's get into it. Um, I want to talk about what we're going to go over today. So our agenda is to go over a brief introduction, talk about what happened in 1955. And then I want to put it in, in context for you. Um, sometimes it's really hard to visualize when we talk about these historic floods and think, well, what does that actually look like? So I've got some modern context. I've got some numbers to throw at you. I've got some uh, weather charts. We'll look at that. After that, we're going to uh, take a closer look at the impacts. Here's where we'll really get into some of those historical photographs. Uh, we'll talk about what was written at the time about this event. Uh, and then next, we'll cover the aftermath what was done in order to ensure that this doesn't happen in the future. And that's where we'll talk about the U.S. Army Corps of Engineer and our role in flood mitigation. Now, I say flood mitigation uh, or flood risk management. I don't ever say flood prevention because floods aren't 100% uh, preventable. You know, there is always some risk involved, no matter how good our systems are, no matter how much we try to uh, look ahead and prepare, there is some risk. So we're here to mitigate that risk to the best of our, our ability. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, in conclusion, I'll mention what the future holds. Um, of course, I don't have a crystal ball, but I'll talk about some of the things that we put in place to ensure that we don't have another uh, flood of 55. And then, of course, I'll open it up to all of you for Q&A. And again, as I mentioned before, please feel free uh, to put your questions, comments in the chat, and we will get to those as quickly as we can. So let's go ahead and start out with uh, a 
brief introduction here. So the flood of 55 is exactly what it sounds like. It was a major, major flood. It was probably one of the worst in Connecticut's history. Uh, there was a hurricane in, I believe it was 38, that was arguably worse. But besides that, there has been nothing like it since colonial times. Um, it was the uh, result of two consecutive hurricanes back to back, one of which skirted our area and the other which kind of gave us a direct hit. So let's talk about those a little bit. Uh, the first one that came through came through on August 11th, 1955. That was Hurricane Connie. Now Hurricane Connie did not give us a direct hit. It kind of skirted us to the west. Um, however, we did have severe rainfall during that event. Now, rainfalls of this amount um, really aren't that abnormal for this area. We do get, I mean, it's on the higher side, uh, but we have seen plenty of events that give us four to six inches of rain. The important thing here, though, is that those four to six inches of rain saturated the ground and filled the creeks. And that kind of laid the foundation for what was to come a week later because it was a week later that Hurricane Diane came through and it was Diane that really caused the flood. That was the thing that tipped the scales. It hit us more directly. It stayed over the area for longer um, and it dumped an additional 13 to 20 inches of rain over a two day period. Now those heavy rains were already on top of saturated grounds and full stream beds. Uh, so you can imagine that water had nowhere to go but downstream. Now at this time, there were some flood control measures on the larger river system. So the Connecticut River did have some flood control measurements uh, or measures in place. Um, I, we were just talking about this before the presentation. I'm not sure when the dikes were built uh, down in Bloomfield, Hartford. They were built by the Army Corps, but uh, in my research, I, I didn't think to look that up. Um, but there were things in place on the Connecticut, Connecticut River. Unfortunately, there were not on some of these tributaries. So uh, the rivers that were most impacted, the Mad River, which runs through Winstead, Connecticut, the Still River, the Naugatuck, the Farmington, and the Quinnebog Rivers. Now, of course, that impacted the towns of Farmington, uh, Putnam, Naugatuck, Waterbury, and Winstead the most. Of course, these impacts stretched all up and down the coast. It wasn't just New England um, and it wasn't just those towns, but these are the towns that really suffered the brunt of the damage. So I want to give you kind of a sense of where this occurred and what occurred. So we'll start with Connie. So here is Connie coming through and what you're looking at here is from uh, the National Weather Service. So you are looking at rainfall amounts for this event from the 11th through the 14th. And you can see if you want to pinpoint yourself on that map, uh, you'll be able to kind of get a sense for how much rain you would have experienced um, during that three or four day event. Uh, as you can see with that lighter green, that eight inches of rain, that's kind of centered right over Litchfield County. Um, so that it may not seem like a big deal to you if you're down in the Hartford area, uh, but you got to remember that water flows downhill and that is all uphill upstream uh, from you. So that's going to be a big problem for everybody all the way down to the Connecticut. Then we take a look at Hurricane Diane and you can see the devastation. Um, Hurricane Diane set an all-time 24-hour rain record in Connecticut on the 19th. So this was measured in Burlington, 12.77 um, inches in a 24-hour period. That is a lot of rain coming through. Uh, you can see the bulk of that rain is really pounding right on the border between Connecticut and Massachusetts. I believe Westfield, Massachusetts also had a really tough time during that flood event. Of course, they've got the Westfield River coming through there. But you can see there's a ton of water focused in the northwest corner of Connecticut. And that becomes really important because that is the drainage basin for two major rivers, uh, the Nogtuck and the Farmington. And then this just shows an overall rainfall accumulation for the entire month of August. So 
this isn't just those two events. It's the whole month that that really hit this area hard. Um, of course, most of this water is coming in during that one week uh, with the two hurricanes coming through. That monthly record, by the way, still stands. Um, Bradley Airport measured 21.87 inches for the month. Uh, now, this isn't unheard of in terms of rainfalls throughout the country. I think uh, the records in some other states like Texas, California, um, and a few others, you know, put us to shame at, I think there's this 40, 43 inches. Uh, but still, given how wet New England can be, um, especially during hurricane season, 21 inches anywhere in the country is a lot of water. Uh, to give you some context on that, second highest rainfall recorded in this area, 16.32 inches, and that was back in 2005. So a significant amount of extra water. Now, it's one thing to talk about these numbers. It's kind of another thing to visualize what that looks like. So some of you will probably remember um, Tropical Storm Irene. Uh, you know, uh, we know, of course, what that did to the New England area. This is a picture actually from um, Shelburne Falls. If anybody knows where Shelburne Falls is, up uh, Northern Massachusetts on the Deerfield River. You can see just how close this raging water is to the deck of that bridge. And, uh, you know, that doesn't account for all of the debris that comes down in a flow like that. This can be really, really dangerous, as we've seen. So I want to kind of give you a sense for what all that rainfall is going to look like here in Connecticut in 55. Um, so to put it in another recent context, um, of course, we just had Hurricane Ida. That was August 2021, so it's fresh in our memory. That dropped up to nine inches of rain in Connecticut, depending on where you were. Okay, so if you think about that whole hurricane, well, tropical, I believe it was a tropical storm by the time it hit us, but that whole event dropped a total of nine inches of rain. Okay, so if you think about that and you think about the devastation, the 54 people that were killed in the region, the 20,000 power outages that were reported during that event, and the estimated $20 billion worth of damages that came as a result of that event. And then if you remember that we have modern flood mitigation infrastructure in place that was not in place in 1955. And when you think that in 55, it wasn't just nine inches of rain, it was 12 inches of rain from a single event sitting on top of five to six inches of rain in a prior event. And you can start to think about just what that's gonna mean. So let's zoom in, let's take a look at Connecticut and see what happens in August, 1955. So take a moment and just figure out where you are on this map, where you live, where you work, where your family is located. So you can kind of get, get a sense of where folks are in relation to some of these major rivers. And then what I'd like to do is I'd like to put up the rainfall uh, records for August, 1955, so that you can kind of see where this rain is falling and what's coming. Now you'll see uh, if you want to actually let me back up a second so it's easier to see. If you take a look in the northwest corner of the state, Colbrook River Lake, that is uh, the reservoir that was created in the wake of 1955. That's where I work. So my uh, flood control dam is on Colbrook River Lake. And as you can see, uh, that Bark Hampstead, the Nipog Reservoir all feed into the Farmington River. So now if you take a look at the rainfall up there, 25 inches of rain for the month of August, and you can tell that Bark Hampstead, Nipog, which I believe were already in place, and the Farmington all the way up into Massachusetts um, are getting drenched. And that water has to go somewhere. What I've got here is I've got another way of thinking about what's happening with those rivers. So one thing that we've historically done um, and done pretty well is measured flow rates for all these rivers, all the way back as far as 1955 and before. 
Um, and so these are some of the rivers that are in our area. Um, and the second column, you're gonna see the locations of our measuring stations. So where we're actually taking these flow rates from. And in the third column, you're gonna see just how much water is flowing through those areas. So the Connecticut River there in Hartford uh, was measured in 1955 during the, the flood of record, 198,000 cubic feet of water per second. 198,000 cubic feet per second. For those of you who have trouble envisioning what that might look like, think about basketballs, if that works for you. That's 198,000 basketballs per second flowing by. Now, of course, as I mentioned, the Connecticut does or did at that time and does today have a pretty robust flood mitigation infrastructure in place. And so 198,000 is a heck of a lot for the Connecticut River, but it's not necessarily uh, where the, the largest danger, the largest risk is posed. It's gonna be those small towns and those smaller rivers that you're gonna really see the risk because they didn't, they didn't see this coming. They weren't prepared for it. So I'm gonna show you where I am up in uh, Colebrook, our nearest station. Um, and it is uh, right by core property. It's on core property. So I go up there and I check this occasionally. We also have uh, digital readouts online. Uh, it's in New Boston, which is um, Sandusfield, Mass Massachusetts. Um, so the West Branch of the Farmington during this event was flowing at 34,300 cubic feet per second. That's a heck of a lot of water. Of course, numbers like that don't tend to mean much to people unless they can see it in action. So let's take a closer look at that. And I wanna give you all a little bit more of a sense of what that wall of water that's gonna be coming down in the 55 flood is really gonna look like. So what does 34,000 cubic feet per second look like? If everybody could, first of all, take a look at the left so that we can kind of figure out where, we, where we're located. So that little pin that I've dropped there, that is the new Boston measuring gauge. You see it's just over the border into Massachusetts on the West Branch of the Farmington as it comes into what is today Colbrook River Lake, which at the time um, would have just been Colbrook River. On the right, if you take a look, you'll see what that river looks like. Um, this was just a couple of years back, I believe that this picture was taken. So this is uh, not at the gauging station, but it's only about a couple hundred yards downstream from the gauging station. To give you a sense for what flow looks like, what you are seeing in that picture on the right hand side, which is pretty normal conditions for this time of year, that's probably between two and 300 cubic feet per second. And I'll say that again, because I want to make sure we get the scale here. Two to 300, not two to 3,000. That's about two to 300 cubic feet per second versus 1955, we're looking at 34,000 cubic feet per second. So it's kind of a lot to imagine. Now I've just put up a graphic again on the left showing the flow of the Farmington from that gauging station in red. And you can see where that water is going to be heading. So as you kind of locate yourself on the map, um, Bloomfield down there towards the bottom right. Uh, and incidentally for you folks in Bloomfield um, and for the library in particular, uh, I did look at our inundation maps and the good news is uh, you, you're in the clear for a catastrophic flood, at least there at the library. So that's good news. Um, it still might be nice to get a little bit more context, a little bit more of a visual so that you can see just what this is gonna look like. So what I'd like to show now um, is actually a video of the Oroville Dam spillway collapse. And this happened uh, back in 2017. I'm sure some of you remember seeing it on the news. I believe if I'm remembering correctly, there were 180,000 people or so who had to be evacuated. And this was due to a breach of the spillway. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna play this clip really quickly and then I'm gonna explain why I'm playing it. 
So, Allison, if you could just Emergency let me know if this is playing for you. Emergency evacuations have been ordered yes. for the following areas. Great. Oroville, Marysville, Yuba City, and points along the Feather River down to Highway 99 and Highway 20. Here's what we can tell you so far. The dam has continued to flow at least 36,000 cubic feet per second through the main spillway. At 36,000 cubic feet per second, it wasn't going to do any more damage to the lower half of the spillway. So what the idea was, was to allow the secondary spillway to take up the slack of approximately 30,000 cubic feet per second. This is an image of the hole when it first appeared in the spillway. As you can see, by the size of the men, it would have taken huge amounts of concrete to fill that hole in an emergency situation. So the problem is, is getting that much material onto the dam that fast. There was just no way to do it in the time span allowed. This is aerial footage of the secondary spillway in action with approximately 30,000 cubic feet per second going over. And this is the part that I really wanted to focus on of this video. So in this uh, dam failure, we're seeing that they're going over to their uh, emergency spillway, 30,000 cubic feet per second. That's what it looks like. And this is no small dam and this is no small lake. In fact, this is, I believe, still the highest dam, the tallest dam in the United States. Um, so that's quite a bit of water. And when you go back and you look at, oops, let me get out of this. How it would have I, taken. Oops, how do I get out of you? No, I don't want to go five seconds back. I want to go to the previous slide. Sorry, folks. Technical difficulties. I am. Uh, I am not the most tech savvy person. Let me try this. Aha! Aha! Okay, victory is mine. Uh, if you think about what you were just seeing, that that. Uh, 36,000 cubic feet per second going over the, the um, primary spillway, third, another 30,000 cubic feet going over the secondary spillway. Each of those is trying to squeeze through this small area. You know, so it's a lot of water coming and not a lot of space for it. One last way to picture it is that's enough water to cover a football field with two and a half feet of water every second. So that's what's coming down in uh, from the Farmington. Of course, as you can imagine, this is a huge problem. Uh, most of the pictures I'm going to be showing are actually uh, from either the Mad River, which kind of flooded Winstead, or from the Naugatuck, which went down and, and uh, really hit Thomaston, Torrington, uh, Waterbury the hardest. Um, I believe there are a few pictures mixed in um, from Bloomfield and surrounding areas, but I'm, I'm not positive. But this should still give you a sense of the extent of the disaster. Um, and this was called a weekend in hell by one of the reporters who covered it at the time. So let's go ahead and take a look at what this looked like on the ground. So as we saw, the rains from Diane began on August 18th, and that happened um, in the wee hours of the morning. That's important because this means that a lot of these waters are rising and a lot of these creeks are filling while people are sleeping. Now this continues uh, throughout the day and into uh, work hours as people are starting to go to work. Major rivers, as I mentioned before, like the Connecticut had flood control measures in place, but the smaller rivers and brooks didn't. There just, there was no anticipation that anything like this could happen. At best, these towns had small dams built primarily for hydropower uh, to power their mill buildings. Um, now with a small stream like these, you might have thought at the time, people might have been forgiven to think that that would be sufficient, you know, to at least slow the waters and keep them safe. But of course, that that proved not to be the case. So these waters rose rapidly in their early hours of Friday morning while folks were either sleeping or while that early shift was first getting to work. And so employees, uh, people were either trapped in their homes uh, or employees became trapped in the mills, factories and businesses. Uh, that made up the bread and butter of these small towns. Um, by 1 a.m. the following day, the governor at the time, uh, Ribikoff, had mobilized the National Guard 
And it was really this quick action by the National Guard, by the police forces, by the volunteer firefighters, Coast Guard citizens, doctors, um, anybody who was around. It was, it was that quick action that really uh, prevented a greater disaster. But even as it was, this was, uh, as you can see from these pictures, a pretty severe event. The Red Cross was able to set up evacuation centers and local doctors were setting up locally wherever they could at certain points to help those who were either displaced from their homes or injured by the floods. And during this uh, event, 25 helicopters were used to rescue people from rooftops, mill buildings, from uh, treetops, from anywhere that people could get to get out of the way of these floods. And most of those, I believe, were down in, um, uh, I believe, were in Waterbury. Uh, by noon on the 20th, the president had declared it a major disaster area, and the state had shipped 300 temporary housing units uh, to help those who were in need. And what you're seeing here on the left, as you can see in the caption, this is the Farmington River. Um, Downstream, I believe that's uh, Unionville, if I'm not mistaken. Oh yeah, there it is in the in the picture. That's Unionville. So you can see just what that's going to do. Um, and this is important to illustrate just what can happen in events like this, so that folks can be aware that they need multiple uh, paths of evacuation. You know, if your plan was to go across this bridge in the event of something unfortunate happening obviously you're gonna to need to make a new plan on the fly. And so it, it's really critical. Um, and this is kind of my soapbox to know where your local evacuation routes are um, and what you're gonna do in the event of a flood like this. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that um, towards the end of the presentation. Um, at the time, you know, of course, uh, this was covered nationwide. Uh, Writers were talking about killer rampages, um, destroying lives, a weekend in hell, um, a staggering toll of death in a shroud of mud. I mean, some pretty, pretty powerful headlines. Um, and they weren't all negative. Um, it should be pointed out that there was actually a lot of positive that came from this. There were a lot of businesses that uh, helped their competitors get up and running again. There were a lot of volunteers who went in to clean up homes and businesses to get uh, traffic flowing again. Uh, it really did, as, as so many historic tragedies have done for our country, it did bring the community together in a time of need and crisis. Um, so there were a lot of positive, uh, positive headlines that came out of this as well. Uh, so I don't, wanna, I don't wanna paint it all uh, totally bleakly. But, I also don't want to downplay just the severity of what we what we see there. So here's Putnam, Connecticut, P uh, Pomfret Street. You can see the mill building on the left before, and then you can see the raging torrent on the right as this flood of 55 came through. You can see just how high the water is reaching um, up above the first level of windows on that mill building. This is the Mad River in Winstead, Main Street. If anybody has driven through uh, Winstead, um, this is what it looked like in the aftermath of the flood. And I should point out that this was the Mad River, as I've mentioned before. So this wasn't even um, quite as large of a river as, say, the Farmington. You know, but yet, this is the devastation that we're looking at here. Now, I'm going to try and make this presentation available for the public after we're done. I'm going to reach out to my public affairs office. Uh, but you can find these images online with a quick Google search as well. Um, and I recommend if you get the chance, um, take them with you, uh, pull them up on your phone, print them out, whatever you need to do, and go take a trip out to Winstead and drive the main street, uh, drive some of these locations where you're seeing this devastation so you can really get a sense for what happened uh, during this event. And, and if you do come out that way, I, I encourage you to just take a right up Route 8 and swing by our project office and come see the dam. Uh, we'd be happy to show you, we have a box full of photographs of the, of the flood um, and the construction of the dam subsequent to that. And I'd be happy to walk you out to the dam and show you um, some more of the infrastructure 
uh, involved in our modern flood mitigation operations. I'm not going to read through this uh, all for you. Um, just some highlights uh, to, to share with you, like just how devastating this was. We've got over 600 dwellings destroyed. We've got over $133 million in damage to businesses alone. Uh, the total damages for the time estimated to be over $200 million. Now, keep in mind, that is $200 million in 1955 dollars. Um, so if you think back to that earlier slide when I was talking about um, Irene coming through, or excuse me, Ida coming through, and the $20 million worth of damages there, um, now you picture $200 million in 1955 dollars, and you can see just how severe this was. Um, in addition to just the sheer economic disaster, there were 87 fatalities uh, and more than 50 coffins floating away from cemeteries and floating downstream. So the, the, the toll in terms of both human life and the tragedy uh, involved here, really we should, we should remember that as we talk about um, this happening and, and uh, what we're doing going forward to prevent it. You know, you can see based on what happened here, just why the Army Corps had an interest in coming in and mitigating this for the future. Um, I do have a couple of videos here that I am going to actually skip over uh, for in the interest of time so that I make sure we have time for question and answer. Uh, these are available online. So if you want to take quick notes, um, or maybe Allison, if you want to throw this up in the chat, this one's called When Disaster Struck, Flood of 55. Um, and this has some footage from that flood event. So I encourage you all to look it up. If we have time at the end, I'll, I'll go back in the slideshow and play it for you. But this is called When Disaster Struck, Flood of 55. There's another one here. Um, this is actually put together by the Mattituck Museum, um, which I encourage you to check out if you haven't been there. Um, this one is uh, called Buried in Water. And again, I'm going to skip this one in the interest of time, but these are available out there on YouTube. Um, so again, this is called Mattituck Moments, Buried in Water. And I'll make sure that hopefully we have that up for you uh, so you can look that up if we don't get time for it. Um, which brings us to the aftermath. So this is where the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers comes in, in the aftermath of 55. Uh, this is not one of our dams. This is actually um, Bonneville Dam. This is out on the Columbia River Gorge out in, uh, in Oregon. Uh, but I just thought it was such an incredible historic photo that I, I needed to share it with you folks. I thought you might enjoy seeing just the scope and scale of what it takes to build these flood mitigation structures, uh, the sheer amount of ingenuity by the contractors, by the engineers, um, by the crews that came out and built these things. And remember, you know, this, this picture actually was taken in the 30s. So what you're seeing there is all with 1930s technology. And uh, those structures are still working as anticipated, as planned um, up, up until today. This will be available for you. Um, so I won't read through this, obviously. I don't want to have anybody fall asleep on me. But to give you kind of some of the highlights, the Army Corps of Engineers, for those of you who aren't aware, uh, is one of the first uh, branches of the military. Well, it's not a full branch. It's under the Army now. Uh, but it's one of the first parts of the military. Uh, it started under George Washington, who realized very quickly during the Revolutionary War that he would need uh, a core of competent engineers to build fortifications, to act as sappers, to destroy fortifications, um, and to handle all of the siege equipment and the, and the machinery of war. Um, and so that was created, really, the Corps of Engineers started out as uh, more of a military-oriented um, operation. Now, as time went on, uh, the fledgling country realized a real need for um, engineers who could design and build infrastructure here in the United States. 
And so as the nation continued to grow, uh, Congress established uh, more of a, a civilian based and, uh, and domestic based uh, Corps of Engineers that was tasked with building some of the major infrastructure throughout the country. So you can see as, for example, uh, the Cape Cod Canal Railroad Bridge in Bourne, Massachusetts there, also built by the Corps. And the Cape Cod Canal is still run by the Corps of Engineers to this day. Um, we still have as our, primary, uh, as our primary objective, flood risk management and construction and engineering. That is still our main mission. Um, but since then, because we run these large projects, these large um, dams, uh, Congress thought it was natural that we should also uh, have a focus on recreation and natural resource management. So those are the other two things that we do. We make sure that people can access uh, these water impoundments for recreation, for fishing, for boating. Um, we also uh, do a lot of hydropower um, and we do a lot of uh, natural resource management. Well, these floods of 55 prompted us to build 36 dams and reservoirs, as well as one tidal barrier uh, down in Stamford, Connecticut, five hurricane barriers. Uh, excuse me, no, the tidal barrier is, my mistake, that's out in Boston. It's the hurricane barrier that's down in Stamford. Uh, dikes, channels, conduits, thousands of acres of non-structural flood protection, whether that is just land we bought up for the specific purpose of flooding, or you know, it could be weirs, it could be um, gauging stations, what have you. 1960, the Army Corps built Thomaston Dam on the Naugatuck River to ensure that the worst never happened again to Waterbury, uh, followed by Northfield Brook Dam, again on the Naugatuck, uh, leading into the Naugatuck Hop Brook Dam in 68, and Colbrook Dam, uh, which is probably most relevant to you folks down there in Bloomfield, uh, because that is uh, we're under the same basin management, but we are on the Farmington River. So we, uh, we have a hand in flood control and prevention for the Farmington River. Um, and that would be Canton, Avon, New Hartford, Simsbury, Bloomfield, so on and so forth. Um, incidentally, these dams are, are all open for you to v visit and view. A lot of folks don't realize that. They see the Army Corps emblem at the gate and they think it's a military installation so they can't come in. It is in fact a military installation but you are encouraged to visit, ask questions, recreate. That's what my primary job is, is to operate the dam and ensure folks are safe and educated and enjoying themselves at our facility. So feel free, do come out and visit us. It's quite a drive across our dam. I, I like to brag that we have the best dam in Connecticut because we have Colbrook River Lake on one side, and then we have Hogsback Reservoir below us. So you're looking at water in both directions. It's very beautiful, picturesque, especially in the fall. We also have a lot of bald eagles uh, that hang around um, and moose and bears and foxes um, denning on our dam. So come check us out, please. Uh, we'd love to have you. Um, as, an, as a result of these dams being built, uh, we spent $538 million, that's our construction dollars total. To date, this is actually a little outdated, I believe these are 2011 numbers, but to date estimated $6.6 .6 billion in damages prevented. Yeah, so that was as of September 2011, so there's even more uh, today because we've had several major events since 2011. So I get a lot of people coming out and they are, you know, resistant, they don't like the uniform, they don't like the, you know, the fact that their tax dollars are going uh, to these facilities that they don't understand the benefit of, especially when I have to tell them, sorry, you can't swim here, fish here, whatever it is I have to tell them, they get a little upset. And, and it's important to get this message out that, you know, we do want to promote recreation, we do want to be a, a resource for the public. Um, but behind the scenes, this is really why we're here. We're here to save lives and money and property. Um, and so far, we, we think we've done a pretty decent job at that. This is a, a breakdown of those uh, estimated damages prevented. Um, I won't go into it. This was just 
during Hurricane Irene in 2011, you can see just how much money uh, was saved in that one, one event. Um, but you know, I don't need to belabor the point here. Um, and so finally, what does the future hold? You know, obviously we know that, that the climate is changing, is going to continue changing. That's going to have implications for weather. That's just a fact uh, of where we're going in the future. And that is a fact of, um, you know, flood risk management. So as a core, we look at what are our risks and that's where we try and focus the most time and attention. So we have this is not ours, this is a simplified version of it, but we do have a risk, um, kind of a risk chart. And we do grade all of our structures and not only all of our structures, but we have an inventory of all dams in the country. Anything flood mitigation related, we are looking at on a regular basis and we are giving it a grade. Um, we're determining how likely it is that something bad is going to happen and how severe it would be if something does happen. And we rank dams accordingly. So most of our dams in this country are actually considered, um, they are high risk dams, not because the infrastructure is bad, but because if something were to happen, the, the damages, the loss of life and the property damage would be so severe that it's just not, um, no matter how low the risk is, we still wanna treat it very seriously. Um, and in order to do that, we do our routine daily inspections. One of my roles is I go out every single day. I, I'm out on that dam. I'm in that tower. I'm operating the equipment. I'm making repairs. I'm doing maintenance. Um, so if you ever come out and you see me sitting in my truck doing nothing, I'm probably just having lunch and taking a breather because <laughs> there's a lot to do. We manage about, at Colebrook alone, we manage a 700 acre lake and about 300 acres of land and there uh are three of us so there's a lot to do we have a robust system of periodic inspections every five years every dam gets inspected ours is actually slated for october of this year 2023 we're going to draw down the pond and actually go into the conduit under the dam we do that in person people walk in we get flashlights we inspect every single surface to make sure everything is still operating as it is intended we obviously also do public outreach that's why i'm here today both because i wanted you know share this uh information about 55 flood with you but also because i want to make you aware of who we are what we do and what resources are available to you i apologize the picture got kind of um, off center here. So it's covering that third or that fourth point. We do have flood inundation maps. We have emergency action plans. We work with local stakeholders, local government to make sure that we are um, keeping everybody safe. And then of course, recreation, nat natural resource management. Um, with that, let me actually skip this real quick. I'm going to put these resources out there for you all. These are where all of my slides, all the pictures and things came from. I really want to plug a couple of things in particular. The top one is the um, National Inventory of Dams. You, as the public, can go on that and you can look at any dam in the country. You can see when it was inspected what the inspection showed, what the rating of the infrastructure is. We are really, as a core, trying to get out and share this information, be transparent, so that the public can make informed decisions about what to do in the event of one of these floods. Because as I mentioned earlier, you, you can't 100% say it's not going to happen no matter how good your infrastructure um, the second one down is actually a website that we maintain for the public so that they can see inflows uh, you can actually check what those gauges at those gauging stations are reading, what the cubic feet per second are at any given point in time during the day. They refresh uh, every 15 minutes or so. And you can also see what our dam is doing. And then the rest of this is um, historical resources um, that I encourage you to check out, including um, bloomfieldcthistory.org, that last one, that is for the historical society. So please make sure that if you're not a member, uh, think about joining or contributing in some way. Um, and with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm sorry, I ran a few minutes long. Um, so hopefully I'm not sharing anymore. Am I still sharing? No, you're all set, but I still have you spotlighted. Okay, cool. Uh, so I'll open it up for questions.
Yeah, so if anybody has questions, you can put it in the chat. We've got some questions and a couple of comments. Let me just go back to the beginning. Um, earlier on, somebody said, also a large flood from 1936, which was bad in the Windsor-Wilson area. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, these, these floods do come up. I mean, we have flooding fairly regularly. Um, you know, and you can see one of the resources that I linked to will show you a uh, flood stage for various places along these rivers. So you can check it in real time. Um, and then I did put links to those videos that you mentioned. So if anybody, you can click on them in the chat, it'll take you to them um, and the titles of them. And then um, question, I thought that the road over the Colebrook Dam was closed to the public permanently after September 11th, 2001. Is it open now? It is open. Um, so perhaps in the immediate aftermath of 2001, it was closed and we no longer can take people into the operation tower. So that is still off limits to the public, but you can drive across the dam. There's parking and a picnic table at the end. So please do come out and visit us. Okay. And um, more than one of us on this live at Seabury in Bloomfield, which is at one end of reservoir number two, I think. We use some of the area that is woodlands and have um, built walking trails with, with the permission of DEEP. That was just a comment about it. Um, where was that goat climbing the dam face? Oh yeah, I, I, I missed my opportunity for my joke. That's, uh, that's our maintenance crew checking the dam. Uh, no, that's actually, uh, that is real. It's a real picture in Italy. Uh, there's a dam in Italy and the uh, goats climb it because the, I believe it's the salts and minerals that leach through the concrete. They get up there and they lick it off. Oh, wow. Um, and then floods don't know town and state borders. Just wondering if there are extra challenges when responding to or managing floods that cover many regions. That's a great question. And it is very challenging when one of these events comes up because we have a lot of stakeholders. So we have the Army Corps of Engineers. We have our own emergency action plans, but we do not issue any evacuation plans for downstream communities. That is the responsibility of the downstream communities. So I encourage all of you to reach out to your local representatives. Um, you should have a disaster management representative for your town uh, or your sheriff's department. And then there's, of course, FEMA is going to get involved. Um, so it, it is incredibly difficult because when you think about something like the 55 flood, it's not just one river flooding in one area, it's all the rivers flooding in all the areas all at once. Okay. And um, another participant is saying um, they'd love to hear other people's memories of the flood. Um, I grew up next to Beeman Brook on Park Avenue and remember, remember seeing rowboats on the road after the flood. Um, if anybody else has memories. So if anybody else wants to throw something in the chat, I will prioritize questions, but feel free to share your memories in the chat. Um, so somebody else, please tell us about the 1984 flood in Windsor, Connecticut. Do you have any insight? I am sorry, I'm afraid I don't know anything about that. Um, I am primarily up upstream and focused uh, mostly on when I do inter programs, it's mostly focused on the 55 flood because that's really kind of our, our bread and butter why we're there. So I apologize. I'm sure if you go to some of those links in the presentation, those um, historical societies and museums would, would be a great resource for you. Okay. Um, we have the 1955 flood also affected the Hartford area. My mom was working at the state capitol and had to take the bus home. Um, oh, I lost myself. Hold on one second here. Had to take the bus home on Capitol Avenue. She said it was the last bus out to West Hartford and the water was inside the bus. <laughs> um, in the 1980s, I was employed as a planner at the Department of Civil Preparedness, now Homeland Security. Some of the old timers talked about the damage caused downtown by the 55 flood by the Park River tributary. What happened to the Park River? I, I um, unfortunately, I'm not familiar with what happened there, but uh, specifically, but I'm sure it, I'm sure it was, as you saw in some of these pictures, I'm sure it was severe. Okay. And then oh, somebody says, pretty sure the Park River was buried underground. And that was a follow up to that. Um, and then another um, comment or memory in 2005, a restaurant in Westfield had a special for 50 years of Hurricane Connie and Diane. If your name was Connie or Diane, you got a free meal. So my mother, Diane, and her friend, Connie, got free meals. 
There you go. Well, hopefully, hopefully not too many more free meals going around in the future. Hopefully we don't have to deal with that again, but yeah. Yeah. Things are under control, hopefully. Um, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> um, it looks like the, the comments have slowed down. Oh, oh, got one more. Let's see. In 1955, I was one year old. We lived on Daniel Boulevard in Bloomfield. We had to be rescued by boat by the fire department. This inspired my dad to become a volunteer firefighter himself. That's, uh, you know, and that um, reminds me that the, the volunteer aspect, you know, and you all, I'm sure volunteer for various things, you're with the historical society, so I'm sure you're, you know, preaching to the choir, but it's so important for you all to get involved um, and be aware of your opportunities to help each other out if an event like this were to occur again. All right. Well, I was just saying, it looks like the, the comments have slowed down, so I don't see anything else popping up. So um, I think that we will end it there. But um, um, so do, you, do you mind, do you mind terribly if I share just a couple of resources really quickly? I just want to share. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and while you, while you do that, I'm going to, there's one, a couple more that are popping in. When I drive on River Road along the branch of the Farmington River in Simsbury, um, to this day, I worry that the old farmhouse and newer houses could be washed away. Well, that's a perfect segue um, into a couple of resources I wanna share. So hopefully you can see the NAE regulated river basins on my screen. Mm -hmm. Yes. This is public facing. The link is in uh, the slideshow. This will show you in real time what is happening with any uh, of our monitoring stations or our dams. So if I click down here into the lower Connecticut river basin, um, I can look at Simsbury right here and I can see what's going on in real time every hour or so what the cubic feet per second is flowing um, so what the stage is now if it's in a flood stage this is going to go to yellow a yellow triangle so you'll you'll be aware uh, when it goes to flood stage in fact it, it was in flood stage last week when we had the big rains coming through um, you can also pull up our dam CRD is Colbrook River Dam it will tell you our capacity, our drainage area, our elevation. It'll tell you what we're doing with our gates, whether we're opening or closing them, uh, what Goodwin down below us is at, what our elevation, this is from sea level is. Um, so this is a great resource for all of you to be aware of because you can track what's going on in real time. Um, you can also check out some of these links on the side. Some of them are pretty interesting. Um, I won't go into them now just for uh, in the interest of time, but there's also a lot of pictures on here. So project photos, you can see what our dam looks like. And this is uh, true of any of these areas um, in the region. So I encourage you to check that out. Um, the other thing that I think is the most important thing you can take away from today is the National Inventory of Dams. It'll bring you to a site just like this. You can find a dam by name or location. So if I look up Colebrook, I'm gonna see my dam right here. And it's gonna bring up everything you ever wanted to know about our dam, including when it was inspected, what the risk profile is, what the risk concerns would be. This is something that's super important for communities downstream to be aware of because it lets you know exactly what would happen if uh, we had a breach at the top of our active storage pool. How many people are going to be impacted during that event? And the best part of this and the most important part for you all to be aware of is up here on the top left view in advanced map viewer. All of our inundation maps are now available to you, which means if you say high pool breach, you want to see what happens when we are at a high pool and our dam breaches. These are the areas that are going to be inundated and you can zoom in and find exactly where your home or business or your child's school is on this map and you can see whether or not you are going to be impacted. So if we want to go down to Simsbury uh, da, 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 and you're looking at the Farmington River here, so here's River Road. Here's a lot of those houses right in that area you're mentioning. Here's those farm areas. You can see exactly what's going to happen if some event were to unfortunately cause us to breach. 
Um, that's also going to inform your decisions on evacuation. Obviously, you're not going to use the Drake Hill Bridge, for example. Um, so this is something that I encourage you all to play around with. And if you have questions, reach out to your disaster managers of your of your town uh, or reach out to the Army Corps. And um, yeah, I'm happy to, to walk you through it. And um, James, just one last question. Are there any security risks with all this information available? There are always security risks. Um, we are always cognizant of that. I just returned from a dam safety training. We do an annual anti-terrorism training. Um, there are a number of things that we do to try and mitigate those risks. But at the end of the day, it's better for you all to have information that will allow you to make informed decisions. Um, and we worry, we'll worry about the security. We have robust security um, uh, uh, systems in place uh, that would prevent anybody from being able to access the dam or do anything that might compromise the dam. But it's better for you all to have this information um, so you can make good decisions. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for your presentation today and for the question and answer. And um, yes, in my follow-up email, I will share the links that I was able to capture. Um, and then James, if, if you follow up later on and you're able to share your entire presentation, then I will forward that to the group as well. Um, and this recording um, will be up on our YouTube page um, very soon, um, hopefully in the next few days. So thank you everybody for coming and thank you again, James, for sharing that information with us. All right, thank take you care, all. bye. Bye.